Today marks 250 years since Captain James Cook and his ship, the Endeavour, first landed at Botany Bay. It was an extraordinary achievement look, on so many levels, but more and more, younger Australians, I don't think, appreciate the historical achievement it was. And, well, I'm going to try and remedy that. Mr Rob Mundell, OAM, is a best-selling author, journalist and competitive sailor who's competed in the Sydney to Hobart race three times. In 2016, he wrote the biography of Captain James Cook and he joins me now from the Gold Coast. Rob Hi, Mundell, Peter. thank you very much for coming on this show on this day in particular. Now, you're a sailor, a cook was a sailor, but he wasn't just a sailor, he was an extraordinary navigator, considered to be one of the best, uh, greatest of all time, and a pretty considerable scientist as well. You've recently written a biography about him. Tell us a bit about the, the man as a seafarer, as a navigator, and some of the skill he had uh, that was really world's best. He just had a natural instinct for it, Peter. Um, he was born and bred to be on the sea, uh, the way uh, from, from day one, it would appear. What happened was um, he had so much talent, he was quite junior in the ranks of uh, the Royal Navy when they decided that they should go looking for the Great South Land, i.e. Australia, and, uh, and they chose Cook to lead that. Now, he wouldn't have got that role if he didn't have the talent. The man was a great leader of men. Um, he was remarkable in every sense, as you mentioned. His navigation was brilliant. He seemed to have a sixth sense as well as where he might find what he was looking for. He came uh, out of England, down into Tahiti, then on into New Zealand, where he proved that it was two islands, not one, um, and then came looking for the east coast of Australia. And uh, he uh, sensed there was something... Well, he knew there was something there because Tasman had already found parts of the Tasmanian coast. And uh, mm. he, he knew if he aimed for that, then he'd get to Tasmania and he worked his way up. Well, he actually missed Tasmania because of the weather, but he came straight up to Botany Bay. I just think it's extraordinary with the, the implements he had at the time, with the instruments he had at the time, that so much of the mapping that was conducted in the voyages uh, were also so, even in today's terms, so accurate. I, I think it's just uh, gobsmacking when we think that we've got all the technology in the world. And, and also the endeavour, the ship, about the size of a tennis court, 90-odd men aboard. Tell me a little bit about that. 100 men on board the ship that size. Um, very bulky, very hard to sail, but uh, it was... I've been on board the replica here in Sydney at the National Maritime Museum, and you can hardly stand up down below. And then on deck, they had 100 men on board. Well, if you put all 100 men in a line from bow to stern, there wouldn't be room for them all. It was very cramped, very dark, very dingy, but it was the best of what was going at the time, and he just excelled. Um, with everything he did. But his seamanship, his ability to sail the... the well, he's circled the world three times, so that tells you something about the man. But um, he just knew what he wanted. And, and one of the interesting things, when, just before he left England, one of the biggest problems in the Royal Navy was scurvy. And uh, mm -hmm. so they, the lot, they lost man after man on long voyages due to scurvy. And what happened with Cook, he came up with this concept that it should be diet. The problem was with diet. So he went into a new diet, planned a new diet with um, a lot of vitamin C in it. When they got to Botany Bay and uh, they uh, landed there, uh, they got held up by the weather and suddenly realised there they'd been at sea for 21 months and not lost one man to scurvy. Unprecedented in the Royal Navy. And that was, again, many of, one of the many talents of Captain Cook. I'm going to ask you in a minute about what it was like when he went ashore, but before I get to that, um, the Endeavour was stuck on a reef near Cooktown. There, there were a number of near misses. You are a man who's been three times in the Sydney to Hobart race. It's about as dangerous as I'd ever get to, to, to seafaring. But how dangerous was it at that time? It, it was remarkably dangerous because he didn't know where... It was like walking through a field of landmines because he didn't know where the reefs were, especially up in that part of the world. And, in fact, it's safe to say, Peter, that if it wasn't for a single puff of wind, which I worked out when I was writing the book, if it wasn't for a single puff of wind, we probably wouldn't be here today the way we are. When he was up there, he ran aground, as we know, on a reef, and he got the ship into uh, Cooktown, as it is known now, repaired the ship, went out again... Um, long story short, got outside the reef to be safe and uh, two or three nights out of that as they were heading north, 
the wind died completely. And uh, there were massive rolling swells like mountain ranges coming across out of the east and moving the ship sideways but not forward. And suddenly they realised in the pitch dark night they could see waves breaking on, a, on an outer bank of the Great Barrier Reef, on an outer coral reef there. So they said, we're in trouble here. He launched the longboats and started getting them to row because there was no wind in the sails to move it. And the ship just kept going sideways, sideways, sideways. They got to be within something like 100 metres. And at this stage, both banks and Cook are saying, we are dead. The ship will be absolutely smashed to pulp. There is no way that we will survive this. That means they don't get back to England. They don't tell anyone what they've discovered because they're not here anymore. So miraculously, the ship was one wave width away from being smashed to pieces on the Outer Barrier Reef and a puff of wind came along and moved it away. Look, it is just extraordinary. You know, this wonderful anniversary of 250 years should be celebrated and known by everyone. I know we're in the middle of this COVID-19 crisis, but, but even going into it, I, I look carefully at all the commemorations planned. They're nothing like they were 50 years ago or even 100 years ago. It's almost like these sorts of milestones in our nation's history are used as a way to rehash the old European invasion angle. Now, Cook wasn't an invader. He was an explorer a scientist, a cartographer, all of these things, a brilliant navigator. And he was part of the Enlightenment, motivated by the best ideals of the Enlightenment. Tell me a little bit about his involvement with the Aboriginal people at, at Botany Bay and obviously later at Cooktown. Well, when he came into Botany Bay, he'd been through New Zealand al already and, and worked very hard there to uh, make peace or, or have, create friendship with the Maoris there. The problem there was they thought... The Maoris thought that the Englishmen were goblins because they rowed their boats to the beach looking backwards, not forwards, and they were certain they must have had eyes in the back of their heads. So when Cook got to Australia, he really didn't know what to expect, um, but got into Botany Bay and went out of his way to create peaceful uh, procedures with, with the locals. But you, you could understand the, uh, the Indigenous people and... We, these people are like Martians. They've come on this object with masts and sails, the likes of which they've never seen. It's a thousand times bigger than their uh, their out their uh, bark canoes, and the people were fair skinned, and so it would have been very scary, very frightening for the indigenous people at that stage. But Cook worked as hard as he could, and the King of England at the time said, "You must try to make peace with everyone you meet," and that was his plan here. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't quite work, but uh, as he got further north, when he went into Cooktown to repair the ship, he did have very good uh, relations with the, uh, with the uh, Indigenous people there, and that was a very positive time for him. But it, we brought two worlds together, so, so far apart ideas and everything else, and trying to bring them in after thousands of years of that side and that side was never going to work overnight. Look, I commend, I commend your book to uh, anyone. I commend it not just to, to adults wanting to read. Uh, please buy it for grandchildren and other kids in your life who I don't think understand sufficiently the brilliant story of Captain James Cook. Rob Mundell, thank you very much for your time tonight.